my pleasure about uh, eight years ago to meet this individual and to my first impression of him is, my goodness, this is a very intelligent and a very well-spoken individual. And I have uh, seen nothing in the past eight years that has dissuaded me from that view. Charlie is an extremely bright individual uh, with a tremendous uh, scientific understanding and uh, very eminent credentials in the field of science, member of the National Academy. I could go on here, talk about uh, all of his credentials, but I can say this, that Charlie came to us as director in 1998, and what I can tell you from the standpoint of the I have known here is that Charlie brings a, a, a fresh view and a new view with respect to the importance of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in terms of its potential to, to and to be an integral part of the communication of science uh, on the part of the institution. So with that said, I can uh, merely say that the thing you're going to do now, what I should do, is be quiet so you can hear Charlie uh, give his lecture today, the title of which I do not know offhand, Charlie, but it's on Aurora Borealis. <laughs> I do know that. So it's a pleasure to have Charlie here. Before I start, I think it's uh, appropriate to recognize the extraordinary contributions and service that Jeff Graham has given to this aquarium museum. In the short time that he was given to lead this museum, he's introduced a number of permanent innovations, one of which is this lecture series. And I'm honored to be invited to be part of it and to join and finally perhaps become a colleague of my scientist friends at Scripps. The title, I think, is Aurora, Myth and Reality. And uh, you'll get a little bit of both in this lecture. Um, you know, if you were to ask the average scientist at Scripps or at UCSD or, in fact, just about any place, when did they first become interested in science, most of them would say, gee, I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in science. Well, I was not one of those young people. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was followed the Scientific American. I was interested in science, all right, but I was more interested in romantic novels <laughs> and even more interested in the Red Sox. So it won't surprise you that the first contact that I had with what became a big part of my life's work uh, was through a romantic short story in my freshman German class in college. This short story was called Berg Kristall by a romantic novelist, uh, Adelbert Stifter. And it told of a young man lost in the Alps, a boy uh, about to freeze to death, who stayed awake watching the majesty of the aurora at night on one of its infrequent visitations to southerly latitudes. And the visual image that was drawn in that short story stayed with me. And of course, it stayed with a lot of other artists, particularly romantic artists of that period. And what I'm showing here is a picture from uh, the Smithsonian of a famous painting by the American romantic artist Frederick Edwin Church from 1865. Now, it's entitled Aurora Borealis to think that he drew his inspiration from a print uh, from uh, the folio edition of Captain Cook's second voyage in which the resolution was uh, trapped uh, in, in the ice between ice islands in the Antarctic. And what Church added was the aurora. And you can see this uh, beautiful display of light at the top. Now Church was clearly not a scientist and he didn't quite get it right. The aurora does not form a halo with a bottom edge like that. The red is above the green. But he did get the sense of the striations of the aurora and the alignment of the light-emitting regions in the upper atmosphere along the Earth's magnetic field. And he did get a sense, you can see a little horseshoe-like structure there. Now, our real understanding of the aurora actually started when uh, people were able to photograph it. And I'm going to show you some modern photographs here. Here's the next one. This, uh, here's one of the horseshoe-like structures of folded aurora. This is, uh, if you go to uh, 
Fairbanks, Alaska right now, uh, at, you will be able to see it in the maximum uh, phase. And what you see is a band of light uh, at the lower bottom and a faint halo aligned in these striations along the magnetic field. What are you looking at? The upper atmosphere is very much like a television screen. And what you are seeing is the impact of electrons of about 10 kilo electron volts energy, about the same as in your television set. They rain down from space, they're accelerated in space, and they penetrate the upper atmosphere till they reach an altitude of about 100 kilometers and they excite uh, a green line of molecular nitrogen. And that's what you're seeing. So the upper atmosphere is a large television screen that reveals mysterious goings-on further out in outer space. Now most of the time you don't see the aurora from below, and the most normal thing is to see it sideways, in which case people uh, tend to think of the aurora as a shimmering curtains of light. And this picture doesn't capture the dynamic variability of the aurora as, the, as each little striation brightens and fades and gives you the sense of wind moving through a folded curtain. Sometimes you see the aurora directly from below, and there you see that it can often occur in multiple bands that are extremely bright. You can see the stars above that and uh, the trees below. And uh, often, uh, we don't know, you know, it's difficult when you're out in the dark to guess how bright the aurora can become. But occasionally, there are extremely bright auroral displays. Typical event, uh, you'll be out watching the auroral curtain that I showed you earlier, and it will start to evolve and fold. And somewhere around midnight, suddenly the entire sky will light up with uh, light, and the whole sky will be filled. This is called, in the technical literature, an auroral substorm. It's a substorm because it's a smaller part of a larger magnetic storm. And when that occurs, the aurora is sufficiently bright that you can see that it's competing with the lights at night in the Geophysical Institute here at the University of Alaska. Now, the aurora, I'm going to argue, is actually one of the oldest of scientific problems. And it was identified very early on. The aurora, for example, was an accompaniment, a constant accompaniment, to the first Native Americans who crossed the Bering Land Bridge 12,000 years ago. It is certainly the case that they saw it every single day. And to this day, the oral tradition of the Inuit people contains many references to the aurora. And the anthropologists will tell you that wherever they have a chance to verify it, the oral tradition is quite accurate. So I will just recount one of the stories. If you're a young Inuit child and you've misbehaved, the aurora will come down and bop you on the head. <laughs> Now, Aristotle knew about the aurora. <coughs> Aristotle believed that the universe was formed in concentric spheres with the solid earth at the middle, and then the oceans, and then the atmosphere. And then at the very top, a layer of fire above. And in his meteorology, he cited the existence, the occasional observations of the aurora, as proof that there was fire above the atmosphere. Not a bad guess. This was uh, the prevailing view. Uh, but uh, the aurora was not studied scientifically after uh, Greco-Roman antiquity, and it became an object of superstition in the Middle Ages. Here is a medieval artist's view of an aurora which appeared over the city of Bamberg in Germany in December of 1560. And, of course, it's a portent of bad things to come. And at lower latitudes, the aurora often appears not as green, but as red, blood red, because what you're seeing there is the excitation at 300 kilometers altitude of uh, 
atomic oxygen by lower energy electrons, 300 electron volts. And this is a, a picture of the red aurora seen over China. How did we come to understand where the aurora comes from? Why should there be this mysterious shimmering light in the northern sky that occasionally makes its appearance at southerly latitudes? What is it? How did people find out? Well, the surprising part of the story is that the aurora has to do with magnets. What I'm showing here is a drawing from a, a recent edition of a book that was published by William Gilbert in the year 1600. Now, William Gilbert just finished his book, and at that point he was about to take on an assignment as chief physician to Queen Elizabeth. But Gilbert had spent the previous 25 years uh, in London interviewing the sailors and asking them as they sailed across the ocean, where does the compass point? Now the sailors had an easy time. They could observe the stars and tell the latitude. But they had a great deal of difficulty determining longitude at sea. And one of the ideas that Gilbert had was that occasionally there were magnetic anomalies, places where the compass didn't behave properly. It spun around. And uh, you could navigate from anomaly to anomaly across the trackless ocean. So Gilbert took all the mariners' maps of where the compass actually pointed, and he displayed them on a sphere which represented the Earth. And then, so we had a map of where the compass actually points at different locations, latitude and best guess at longitude on the Earth. Then he took a magnet, a permanent magnet, and he shaped it in the form of a sphere. And he took a small compass and moved the compass over that sphere. And he declared, from the similarity of the maps that the mariners had made and that he had synthesized, and the map that he made on his little sphere, that the Earth was, in fact, a giant magnet that attracted the magnet that was the compass. So what you're seeing here to the left and to the right are the points where the compass points straight down. And at the top, in this particular drawing, is the magnetic equator. Now Gilbert actually created his own magnetic anomaly by gouging a hole, or a, a gouging a, a way, part of this magnetized sphere. And there the magnetic pattern revealed by the compass actually looked like an anomaly. Now, so what had Gilbert done? Basically, if I now turn the Earth right side up with the North Pole and the South Pole, the Earth behaves as though it had a giant magnet in its interior. And any of you who have done freshman physics experiments know that iron filings act like little compasses. If you spray them, uh, put them around the magnet, they will line up. And from the way the iron filings uh, pattern connects, you can trace out these lines here, which we call magnetic lines of force. Now, what Gilbert did was even more daring. He took his compass off the surface of his little earth, the Torella, out into space where no mariner of his day could go. And he declared that the magnetic influence of the Earth extended above the surface of the Earth and out into space. So this was in the year 1600. Now we turn to the sun. Aristotle had thought the sun was a polished crystalline sphere, absolutely a vision of perfection. But in the year 1612, Galileo reported in a letter to the Grand Duchess Christina that, in fact, the surface of the sun was pockmarked. It had spots on it. Now, uh, this was important philosophically at the time. But it was also important 
scientifically because Galileo could watch the sunspots march across the surface of the sun on a day-by-day -day basis. And from that, he concluded that the sun rotated and it had a 27-day period. So the sun was a rotating sphere. Now, a very intelligent observer to this whole debate was the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler. And Kepler reasoned just shortly after Galileo's book was published that since the Earth was a sphere and it rotated, it had a magnetic field. And since the Sun was a sphere and it rotated, it too must have a magnetic field. And since we knew from Gilbert's work that the magnetic influence of these bodies extended out into space, that somewhere in the space between the Sun and the Earth, the magnetic field of the Earth and the Sun somehow interacted. And it was that interaction that pushed the Earth around its orbit and made the elliptical orbits that Kepler was calculating. Now he got it wrong about dynamics, but the idea that the two fields interacted uh, is very ancient and is correct. Well now, this is a map now of time starting at uh, 1610 at the top and ending up with about 1980 at the bottom. And what you're showing is the periodic pattern of appearances and disappearances of the sunspots on the surface of the sun. And we know now that these sunspots appear and disappear with a regularity of about a 13-year period, the so-called solar cycle or the solar magnetic cycle. And you can actually see Galileo's first measurement on the very left there. And then uh, following up, the Vatican Observatory continued to measure the motion of the sunspots on the sun. But then an alarming thing happened. They disappeared for about 70 years. And they started coming back in about 1714. And in 1716, there was a giant auroral display that was seen over uh, London and reported uh, by Edmund Halley. We know today that this was no accident. But what I want to do is tell you how it is that we came to understand that the waxing and waning of the aurora is connected with the waxing and waning of the sunspots on the sun. And it is somehow related to this interaction between the two magnetic fields. This is a, a picture, one of the first photographs of the aurora taken in 1880. And its purpose is to remind you, remind me to tell you, how it was that we came about to understand that the aurora was associated with the Earth's magnetic field. In 1724, an English scientist, William Graham, uh, reported that he made himself a very sensitive compass, and he reported that it was always jiggling. Earth's magnetic field, in Gilbert's terms, was never steady. It was always moving around a little bit. And there was a auroral observer named Hjörter in Uppsala, in Sweden, where they observed the aurora all the time. And he made 20,000 observations of the aurora. And as soon as Graham reported that the compass moved, he moved his compass, a compass, underneath the aurora. And he found that the appearance of the aurora was associated with changes in the Earth's magnetic field, in the compass. And more than that, he was able to show that when Graham observed the motions of the magnetic needle in London, Hjörter was observing an aurora in Uppsala. And this was hundreds of miles away, so it conveyed the idea that the aurora was very high up in the atmosphere. Now another part of the story was filled in actually by Captain <coughs> Cook. You may remember the picture I showed you of the bar magnet with the Earth and the magnetic field lines reaching out into space. And there was a northern and a southern pole to this magnet. And there's a basic symmetry. 
So if you see the aurora in the north, you should also see it in the south. And it was in 1773 on Captain Cook's second voyage that he actually penetrated the region where the aurora is most probably seen. That's this uh, sharp dotted line. And uh, he observed the aurora for a period of about three weeks on his voyage and verified the symmetry of the appearance of the aurora in the northern and southern hemisphere. Now this overlay, the dotted line, uh, which is a statistical assemblage, comes from looking at hundreds of thousands of observations of the aurora like order and just plotting, plotting where they're most likely to occur. Now we don't have to do that anymore because of space observations, and you'll see some of that later. The next piece of the puzzle uh, was added in uh, about 100 years after Captain Cook's voyage in 1859 when a British observer, Richard C. Carrington, saw the first solar flare. And what you're looking here is a picture of the sun in x-rays where solar flares turn up very clearly. But they're very rare. Uh, it's very rare that they're so bright that you can see them against the total light of the sun. But that's, in fact, what happened. But Carrington was very clever, and he saw this flare. And he went down the street to his friend Balfour Stewart, who was the geomagnetician. <coughs> He was now, everybody carried little compasses around to measure the change in the magnetic field you know, amongst the scientific community. And Stewart told him that about eight minutes after this flare, there's a little jump in the compass. And 18 hours later, there began a major perturbation, a major drop in the Earth's magnetic field that was as large as had ever been seen. And this particular magnetic storm uh, enabled the aurora to penetrate as far south as India. And there was a worldwide display, and this was one of the strongest displays ever observed. So now we had a mysterious connection then between the appearance of a bright flash of light on the surface of the sun, and 18 hours later, the period, uh, the appearance of the aurora in great intensity at southerly equator with latitudes. What was this connection? Well, this connection was so mysterious, and there was so little physical basis for this association. The theoreticians are very suspicious of some astral influence on the Earth. But Lord Kelvin, a physicist and a rigorous thinker, pooh-poohed the whole idea of an association between sunspots and the appearance of the aurora. It's a statistical anomaly. It just couldn't happen. And he stated this in an important lecture in 1892 before the British Association for the Advancement of Science. But it was at the same meeting that G.F. Fitzgerald, of Lorentz Fitzgerald relativity fame, uh, thought somewhat differently about the idea. And Fitzgerald uh, was aware of all the work that J.J. Thompson had done in elucidating the atomic structure of matter. And he realized there were atomic particles, electrons and protons. So he simply argued that at the time of the solar flare, what happened was the sun was putting out a stream, he thought, of electrons. And uh, that these uh, propagated across the solar system and hit the Earth, and thus they carried a current, and they changed the Earth's magnetic field. And you could, by just noting when the sunspot parent of the solar flare was at the central meridian of the sun and how far it had rotated by the time you saw the magnetic storm, you could figure out the, both the rotation rate of the sun and how long, how speed, fast these particles were going. It's about 300 kilometers per second. Sir Oliver Lodge repeated the same idea in 1900. But of course, at that point, Oliver Lodge had the experience of uh, a laboratory experiment that had been done by the great Norwegian experimentalist, uh, Birkland. And Birkland actually uh, took 
a little Torella, what you're looking in the middle of this picture is a round magnet very much like the one that, uh, that Gilbert had. And at the far end, he has a gun that is shooting electrons. This is a precursor of a vacuum tube, by the way. Um, a gun that was shooting electrons at this magnetic field. And what Birkeland liked about this picture is you can see, look at the front side, the back's a little more complicated, but look at the front side and you can see where the light is. What you're seeing is the light of those electrons hitting the atoms of the air in the experimental volume and lighting them up, just as in the aurora. And you can see that there's a band of intense light at the northern and southern poles of this magnet. So this was making the idea that Fitzgerald and Lodge had looking very good until the year 1912 when a German physicist, Schuster, said, well, look, you know, uh, you can't, you might be able to send electrons across three feet of a laboratory apparatus, but you cannot send them alone across the entire reach of the solar system because their electrical repulsion, they're all negatively charged, they'll blow this beam of electrons apart. They'll never get there. So at that point, it, the whole idea looked stymied until another physicist, English physicist, F. A. Lindemann, who was, ended up being Churchill's science advisor. Lindemann just made the obvious suggestion, hey, look, uh, this beam has got both electrons and protons in it, positive and negative charges, and uh, so it won't fall apart. And so it's got to be a neutral beam, but they've got to be separated. Now this idea that a neutral beam of electrons and protons, or what today we would call a plasma, was shot across the solar system at the time of solar flares, is one of the founding statements of the modern science of plasma physics to which I devoted a good deal of my life. Now, at that point, the question was, well, okay, now at solar flares, every now and then there's this big glob of plasma that goes across the solar system at 300 kilometers a second. What happens when it hits the Earth? And this problem was attacked by another great geophysicist, Sidney Chapman, in a series of papers beginning 1930. And what he said was, well, look, when this blob of plasma hits the Earth's magnetic field, the electrons will go to the left, and the protons will go to the right. There'll be a current that flows out in space, and that electrical current will create a magnetic field that bucks out any field in the uh, flowing plasma, and all the Earth's magnetic field, you're looking at the t from the top here and the side on the right, all the Earth's magnetic field, as you can see, all those field lines uh, will be uh, confined. And so this solar wind, this solar plasma, bursty stuff, will every now and then squash the Earth's magnetic field and somehow create the aurora. But this is a piece of the mysterious connection that uh, Kelvin couldn't see. Well, this was the situation that prevailed from 1930 to about 1960. And the real change came uh, with the advent of the space age. And the space age enabled us to do two things that Gilbert couldn't do or anyone else since then. And that was to get out there and get our hands on this plasma and actually make measurements of both the magnetic field and the plasma. And as you will see, it enabled us to get away from the Earth and all the cluttered detail of earthbound observations and to get an absolutely new pictorial view of the aurora. And I'll talk about both of those. So re recall now Chapman's work that somehow the Earth's magnetic field would be confined uh, and there would be a transition to solar plasma. When the first satellites, Mariner uh, Explorer 10, uh, moved out from the Earth, and went out to about a distance of 10 Earth radii in 1958, they actually discovered the transition. They saw a place inside the white region on the right in which there was the Earth's magnetic field that looked more or less the way Gilbert had drawn it. 
and suddenly there was a boundary and you got into a place where there was hardly any magnetic field at all and what there was was very variable. And the people who were looking at electrons and protons found them out there. And they found them out there not even at the time of solar flares, just any old time. So it turned out that the sun was putting out something that we now call the solar wind. Constantly, all the time. Sometimes it has gales, sometimes it's a breeze, but it's always there and it's always interacting with the Earth. And it's very changeable, extremely changeable. And the other thing that happened was that that first spacecraft got out there with a magnetic field detector and it verified Kepler's hypothesis that the Sun had a magnetic field that was extended out into space. Now, remember, look at this white region at the right. Nobody knew what would happen behind the Earth. Most of the aurora appears at night, so most of the action has to be behind the Earth. Nobody knew what would happen behind the Earth. Until another theoretician, James Dungey from England, Imperial College, took, if you will, Kepler's hypothesis that the solar magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field would interact. And they do so in a very special situation when the solar magnetic field is pointed in the opposite direction of the Earth's magnetic field up at the front. And then a modern process called reconnection occurs. The two fields and the plasmas on them interact. And this has the effect of closing off the magnetic field downstream on the night side of the Earth where most of the aurora is seen. And so it's this process that carries out the original vision that was naively imagined by Kepler 400 years <coughs> earlier. So today, we have an understanding, in part, of the way the aurora was created. The aurora is a signature of events that occur in the vastness of space surrounding the Earth. The events occur because the solar wind changes. It's constantly changing all the time. It flows against the Earth. There's a, a shock wave ahead, and then you see this magnetic cocoon surrounding the Earth, containing the radiation belts and energetic particles and many other things. But each time that the solar wind changes, the buffets the magnetosphere of the Earth, this magnetic atmosphere, buffets it. And this atmosphere has to respond. And it has to connect up appropriately with the upper atmosphere, where all these magnetic field lines plunge into the Earth. And this connection process, the relationship between the motions in the upper atmosphere and the motions in deep space, is carried out by the flow of electrical currents along the field line. These currents are what's causing the magnetic field to change underneath the aurora. And these currents arrive at regions where the particles that have to carry them must be accelerated to 10 kilovolt energies. So finally, the currents are carried by these 10 kilovolt electron beams that light up the atmosphere. So the aurora is a signature of the constantly changing space environment around the Earth and is indirectly related to the activities on the surface of the Sun. This much we understand. How it is made, what the connection between Sun and Earth is that made the relationship uh, between the aurora and sunspots. But the space age also enabled us to see much better. Remember I told you that this laborious sorting of auroral observations from the surface of the Earth convinced people that the aurora most likely, was most likely to occur in a band called the auroral oval at high latitudes. 
This is a picture from the Dynamic Explorer satellite. It's about 15,000 miles away from the Earth, and you can see that band. So uh, 200 years of sortings of hundreds of thousands of rural observations is reduced to that. There it is. There's one in the south, too. Just take one look at it, you understand. <laughs> now, look, get a little closer to the Earth. This is a picture from a uh, defense military satellite program, a weather satellite. Uh, what you're looking now is at this auroral band, and you're looking at some of the detailed structures from about a thousand kilometers above. And now, remember, I showed you the variety of pictures taken from the Earth. You saw diffuse light, you see that at the bottom. You see a connection of uh, auroral arcs, those are, are the curtains from the top. Uh, you see the folds. Uh, you see little knots of intensification. And each of those structures corresponds to a place where the interaction between space and the atmosphere is causing a current to flow upwards. Well, now you ask, what are these things down here in the bottom, those little spots of light over in the left? Those are cities. And when there's an auroral display, there's as much power in the auroral display as in the entire world's electrical net, which is why the space photographs uh, of the aurora show the cities with equal intensity. But the best view of the aurora has been obtained by the shuttle astronauts. When NASA decided to send the space shuttle to Mir, they had to go to a high inclination orbit to northerly latitudes. And this meant the shuttle astronauts would have a greater chance of seeing the aurora. They have a wonderful view because they fly right through it. Uh, at a 100 to 160 kilometers altitude. And occasionally they even see in their own eyes the impacts of uh, cosmic rays creating little flashes of light. What you're seeing here is a view from the shuttle. Uh, you're looking at an auroral curtain. You can see the striations along the Earth's magnetic field line. And you can see the green light from 10 kilovolt electrons at the bottom and the red light from oxygen and 300 volt electrons, lower energy, at the top. The way it should be, and not the way Frederick Edwin Church painted. You see all sorts of views of the aurora. Here's a, another pair of auroral arcs uh, that extends out over to the sunrise horizon with, the, again, a halo of red light on the top. Uh, you can see the aurora in full moonlight. And you can see that it's above the clouds. You can see that the aurora with the red at the top and the green at the bottom and the stars in the background. And finally, the most spectacular picture of them all was taken by my wife's cousin, Jay Apt, who happened to hit the northerly latitudes just as an auroral substorm was starting. And the whole sky surrounding the shuttle uh, was lit up with a, a bright spot at the lower left is the great auroral surge. You can see the auroral arcs. Uh, you can see the striation and the structure. The red at the top, green at the bottom. So now we can see the global features of this auroral substorm when from the surface of the ground all you knew was that the sky lit up. So this much 20th century science, and especially space science, did. So you might ask, what's left? We really understand the energy source of the aurora. We understand its connection to the sun in a qualitative way. But what is left is a problem for 21st century science. 
Now those striations are extremely fine in scale. Maybe as you fly through them a few hundred meters across and you're looking at a few thousand of kilometers in this picture. Those striations light up and disappear. And so the delicate motions and the extreme spatial location, spatial localization of the actual source of uh, auroral electrons is still not understood. And more than that, we know that when you see a big auroral substorm like this, as you do in this picture, that it corresponds to a major and sudden reconfiguration of the structure of the magnetic fields and plasmas in the space surrounding the Earth. And we do not know the nature of that reconfiguration and why it starts, and why it starts with a region that on the surface of the Earth maps to maybe a quarter kilometer out of thousands. So there's much to be done. And as always, I think, this story illustrates a certain universal um, aspects of science. There's a mysterious connection between science and art, and scientists and artists, and that as you achieve something in art as in science, uh, you only set the stage for the people who follow after you. Thank you. Why do we usually see the phenomenon uh, in the wintertime? Well, think of it. Uh, the aurora occurs most of the time at high northern and southern latitudes. And during the summer, the sun is shining. And uh, the aurora is always there. We just don't see it. But we begin to see it about, uh, you know, we see it uh, starting in uh, sort of around Labor Day and going through to about now. And the day becomes too long. Why, why does the aurora occur at night? That's an extremely good question. Uh, and that was the, one of the key questions that Dungey's reconnection model solved because there had to be a second region at the, at the night side of the Earth where this merging of magnetic fields took place a second time. And it's that process that's occurring there that is causing most of the variations in the magnetic field that are related to the aurora. And so that, that, that Dungy model that showed the closing off of the Earth's magnetic tail, that was the one that explained why the aurora occurs at night. Yes, indeed. Uh, do aurorae occur on other planets? The most intense aurora on the solar system occur on Jupiter. And there are two different kinds of aurora on Jupiter. There's the kind that we have, that comes from the interaction of Jupiter's magnetic field with the solar wind, same as ours. But there's another interaction because Jupiter has a conducting moon, Io, that sits inside the strongest part of its magnetic field. And Jupiter rotates around at a different rate than Io goes around. And this causes vast magnetic currents to flow, electrical currents to flow from Io to the planet. And there's an aurora underneath the magnetic footprint of, aurora, of Io that follows it around. And there are aurora on Saturn and Uranus and Neptune as well, but they're not nearly as, um, as big. The magnetosphere of Jupiter is so big that actually it's the largest, I don't know whether you'd call it an object, it's the largest thing in the solar system. Can I define a solar plasma? That's a very good idea. Um, you, the sun is emitting a wind at all times from its, from its upper atmosphere. A wind is flowing outwards throughout the solar system. Just as, and our wind here is composed on the surface of the Earth of electrically neutral atoms, in which the positively charged ions and the electrons are together to form an atom. But in the sun, the electrons, negatively charged, and the positively charged nuclei, 
protons mostly, are separated. So this is an electrically charged, electrified wind that flows out from the sun. And because it is electrified, it is able to carry electrical currents, and those then can create and sustain magnetic fields. Way in the back, please. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest questions that uh, concerns the survivability of life in space will be whether uh, the astronauts can take uh, the radiation dose uh, of very energetic particles that occurs at the time of solar flares. And so it is certainly the case that um, the solar flares are a danger to uh, any living thing in space. Fortunately, they don't happen all that often. Uh, our magnetic field of the Earth shields us, actually, from most of the effects of the very super energetic radiation from solar flares that goes into the poles. But it's the case that if you fly in an airplane at high altitude uh, to Europe, uh, and you will go over the area where the uh, magnetic field does not shield us as well. The answer is yes, solar flares are a danger to the space station and astronauts. Uh, yes, there's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. Can you hear the aurora? There are people uh, who believe, and there's a, a story out there, that the aurora creates sound waves that can be heard uh, at the surface of the Earth. This is because the, all the electron bombardment heats the upper atmosphere very suddenly. What we do know is that it creates sound waves that propagate in the upper atmosphere at 100 or more kilometers altitude, 60 miles. And they propagate around the Earth. And uh, a few minutes after uh, an auroral display in the polar regions, the infrasonic waves will arrive at the equator. It's somewhat less clear as to whether you can hear them uh, at the surface of the Earth. And that's in part because, uh, because of the way sound travels at low temperatures. You hear crackling. But there is, there is this, there are many people that believe you can hear the aurora. It may just be the cold, dry weather uh, <laughs> and the things around you. It's a bit hard to sort out. But we do know they create worldwide propagating sound waves that stick to the upper atmosphere. Why is it called the aurora borealis? Aurora means dawn, so it means northern and southern dawn, aurora australis. Uh, is there any relationship between the aurora and the Van Allen belts? A very interesting question. The Van Allen belts sit inside, closer to the Earth, on the parts of the magnetic field that don't couple strongly to the aurora. But it is certainly the case that when there's a magnetic storm or other changes in the solar wind, the Van Allen belts will react. And so you'll see a reaction in the Van Allen belts at the same time you see an aurora. But they're, they're physical when they're separated in space. The aurora goes out this far and the Van Allen belts go out that far, separated in space and in physics. Well, thank you very much. Good night.